Arizona is home to more than six and a half million people and is one of the fastest growing states in the nation. We have a lot to be proud of. We are known for our entrepreneurial and innovative spirit. We are on the forefront of new technologies such as solar energy and advances in bioscience. We are a thriving community with tremendous opportunity before us. Arizona is on the cusp of a demographic shift that will have a significant impact on the future of our state. The Latino population, currently the fastest growing population group, will become the majority by 2030. It is time to start the conversation about how to secure Arizona's future and how educating every student is essential to ensuring our state's economic prosperity. Latino students are graduating high school behind the curve. Latinos are the majority in K-12 and therefore will end up being the majority of our workforce. If they are not prepared, they will not succeed. If they do not succeed, Arizona does not succeed. Helios Education Foundation is committed to Latino students in Arizona because when you look at the demographics and you understand the data in closing the degree attainment gap, that if the state of Arizona prioritizes Latino student success, that this is the opportunity to have the greatest impact on the future of Arizona. The opportunity to partner with Michael Crow and Arizona State University and the presentation that he will be providing around changing the dynamics of education to support all students is really an intentional community dialogue. Helios is driven and committed to raising the awareness to the importance of Latino student success across the full education continuum. And to have Michael Crow sort of weigh in with a vision and leadership describing how a university as large and broad and diverse as Arizona State University can make changes to ensure that they're serving the type of students that are now in the education pipeline, and in particular Latino students, is an opportunity for us as a community to understand how do we get engaged in that work? How do we begin to change the system to ensure that all students are successful as they move their way to post-secondary education? Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming my friend and the president of Arizona State University, Dr. Michael Crow. Thank you, Vince. Thank you, uh, Vince, for that uh, very nice introduction. And uh, I get the opportunity here to put on my professor hat, which some of you will like and some of you won't. The part of me as professor that you won't like is there's lots of data, lots of analysis, and lots of intellectual rigor behind each of the arguments, because that's what professors do. We try to make the case based on this strange thing called facts, this unbelievably complicated thing called a fact. And it may not be the only fact, but I can guarantee you that these are the best facts that that, that we can get at the moment. But the, the other hat that I'm wearing, which is not reflected in my clothing, is that you might not understand that in the United States there are many units at the front line of the ultimate success, defense, and ultimate, I guess I would call it the ultimate achievement of the American dream, front line units. It's not just the military fighting our enemies and protecting us. There are frontline units involved in this thing called education, this transformative process wherein we are charged with producing the next generation and enabling the next generation to be able to adapt to what lies ahead. The things I have to say are coming to you from that front line. And it's a rough front line. I don't mean in the sense it's a rough front line because everything's changing. The world economy is changing. It has changed and is changing even more. The dynamic forces of what we think of as economic opportunity are not the same that they were even in 1995. They will never be that way again. Global competition, speed of change, Dynamic forces, cultural forces, social forces, all swirling at their fastest possible speed. All in a country with fundamental principles about 
the person and the rights of the person and liberty and justice and all these other things that we hold as these unbelievable ideals, all driven behind this objective of how might we actually do what this country was set up to do, which is to allow each of us to pursue happiness. Not just for ourselves, but for everyone that's here. That's the way this place was designed. So if I say nothing else, if you don't follow any of the slides I'm about to walk through, I can tell you that, that the previous slide right here, this, this slide right here, Arizona's economic imperative, leading the nation in Latino student success. I'm going to show you some numbers and walk you through some numbers that basically lead you to be able to conclude the following. If, by whatever means necessary, we find a way to lead the nation in Latino success, our economy will go from the 80th percent of per capita GDP, which it is right now, to the 110th percent of per capita GDP. The entire economic position of Arizona is altered by the attainment of that objective. And I'm going to outline a series of data and statistics and trends for you that will indicate to you that if that is not done, then the economic consequences will be the, just the opposite. Just the opposite. So, I want to talk about this imperative. And I, I can't have a conversation about this without getting people to actually understand. And this is a thing I've used in several talks. The Massachusetts Constitution, drafted, written, and put in place before Massachusetts was even a state, says that about education. Just read it. Every word. It's unbelievable. And it goes on to say this. This, by the way, was the model constitution for all subsequent state constitutions, including our own. And then it says this. Just assume that there are some universities here in Arizona that are that, that the people have built, three of them, and some community colleges that support them and feed into them and support the community. Now, we know that there's a dream in the United States. Many of our families have experienced it. Vince's family immigrates. Uh, my wife's mother is an immigrant, she's a daughter of immigrants, some of you are, and at the end of the day, we all are. And we all have this dream about a happy family coming to the United States and the family being successful and the family being happy. The path, this is really important, this slide. This is really important. Who holds the highest aspiration of the American dream among ethnic minorities in the United States? Hispanics. It's unbelievable. The highest level of aspirational desire for the dream. Strong family-based culture, strong family core units. Uh, all kinds of factors feed into this, but this is unbelievable. And by the way, to you personally, but then you've also got people that, that don't see it. Latino population. This, by the way, is in millions of people. Millions of people. I don't know if you think 100 million people is enough people to sort of start thinking about. <laughs> and sort of process. In fact, you know, I'm, I, I'll tell you, I'm not a big fan of, of lots of labels that people get assigned. I think at the end of the day, there's the one label, American. There's Americans and people that want to be Americans. That's kind of the, the labels that we have. There's Americans and the people that want to be Americans. And we need to find a way for these things to to uh, be uh, meaningful. And this, by the way, is numeric change. This isn't the population. Of the 156 million additional people anticipated living in the United States by the year 2050, 100 million of those 150 million will be from families of Hispanic origin. Now, I say to people all the time, I'll, I'll hear some people over here this little group that apparently can't, you know, populate itself very much here. So I, I, I hear sometimes people say to me, 
well, I wish the world really wasn't working this way. I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, you know, it's, it, the country's so different than when I grew up or when my grandparents grew up. And I'm like, yeah, and it was different for their parents and their grandparents and their parents and their grandparents before them and their parents and their grandparents before them. I'm the 14th generation descendant of English immigrants. My family were indentured servants on an island in the Chesapeake Bay called Kent Island. I don't think the world's the same as it was then. There was a revolution since then, a civil war, all kinds of other things. It's just not the same. So it's like, just get over it. This is the way it's going to be. <laughs> so in the last hundred years of our society, since we decided we wanted to educate our population as a part of our public duty, which is something we've been, we decided about a hundred years ago, educational attainment has been the single most important explanatory variable to social mobility. There are no other variables that explain as much about social mobility. So people always want to say, well, Steve Jobs didn't graduate from college. And Bill Gates didn't graduate from college. Barry Bonds didn't graduate from college. He went to ASU. <laughs> and they all make or made lots of money. I said, they don't count. You can add them all up on one hand. They don't count. So here's what this slide really says, higher education and social mobility. So if you are born into a family in the lowest 20% of family incomes, and in Arizona that means you are poor, that is the poverty line. If you're born into that family and you do not get a college degree, chances are you're going to stay in that quintile. 50% do not move from that quintile in their life. If, however, you're born into that lower 20%, look at this change, just from that one thing. So when you listen to people talk about, is college really worth it? Well, I'd say for people born in the bottom quintile of family incomes, let me tell you how it's worth it. You get a completely different economic outcome just from that one variable alone. Is it the only variable? No. Is it the only way to make these things happen? No. Will it ever be the only variable? No. It doesn't, it's not meant to say that. It's meant to say it's the single most important predictive variable that we can affect. Now, people do not get this. I can tell they don't get this in Arizona in particular because things have grown here and everybody's happy here and lots of people moved here and lots of things were happening. So what these lines tell you is that in the 35 years between 1975 and 2010, if you're doing a non-routine job that requires cognitive capabilities, that's construction, chef, you know, all kinds of things where your brain's working and you're creative and so forth, lots of jobs. If you're doing, let me get this right, that's, this is jobs here, these two jobs here are highly growth oriented. Non-routine, cognitive, this is the chef job the uh, builder job, the designer job, the construction jobs, lots of growth, non-routine manual, non-routine cognitive. Most of us in this room, by the way, have been in non-routine cognitive skills. You are masters of numbers and letters, numbers and letters, 36. Now over here, and this, by the way, is a logarithmic scale, routine jobs, routine jobs, they're gone, gone. The economy has been hollowed out, hollowed out. This is a, I'm calling this employment polarization. An entire section of the previous economies, the industrial economy, the agricultural economy, even the early stages of the high-tech economy, gone. Now, what's the value to the individual of education? So how many of you heard these stories that going to college isn't worth it? Come on. More of you have heard that. Do you like not read the newspaper? <laughs> so the internal rate of return for a degree is substantially exceeds the cost of attendance. 15%. That's per year. That's average. Some jobs are 23% annual rate of return to going to college for your investment. Some are seven. The stock market for the last 50 years has been between five and seven. True for the so-called underemployed college graduates. 
The investment is still worth it. Their contribution to the economy is still in excess of what it would have been. And let me show you how that works. This is mean earnings over your life based on your level of educational attainment. Now tell me there's not a correlation. Remember, I'm on my, wearing my professor hat here. There's not a correlation between educational attainment and lifetime income. So look at what happens here. This is something that people don't understand. So before the age of 30, there's very little difference right here. Before the age of 30. This is when you hear lots of complaining and grousing and wondering and all kinds of decisions that are being made, including decisions being made in, in typically low-income communities. Oh, well, you know, you can make almost as much as that guy that went down the street that went to college. And that's true for a while. But what about this person that went to college right here and finished college versus this person that only finished high school? And by the way, if you didn't finish high school, you're like way down here. But look at the correlation. Just look at the data. This is the entire workforce in the entire country. So the return to the individual for educational attainment is massive. Learn to learn. This is what people don't understand about higher education. It is not about learning to do a job. How many of you are doing the same job as when you were 18? How many of you have done more than four different kinds of jobs? How many of you have had more than two different types of careers? You know the statistics going forward, 12 jobs, four careers will be the average. 12 jobs, four careers. Average. If you don't learn how to learn, you will not make it. Look at this chart. Rising earning disparity between young adults with and without a college degree. So if you're in the millennial generation, the Gen Xers, it used to be back when most of us were coming up, eh, it's kind of correlated, wasn't going down. This is the effect of the structural change in the economy. So for millennials, their actual ability at lower levels Red is bachelor's degree. Just think of bachelor's degree. Don't think of it as a degree. This is really important. Think of it as a proxy representing your ability to learn, not what you know. This is really important. It's a proxy for your ability to learn. You look at this for millennials. You tell me when social unrest rises to a common everyday occurrence, not counting the common everyday occurrences of social unrest that we're witnessing right now. I'm talking about social unrest on a very large scale. Value to society, this again is the value of college. So this is just since 2007, all you need to know is in the entire American economy, and these numbers are even worse in Arizona, if you do not have a high school diploma, there are 14% few, fewer jobs in the economy than there were in 2007. Fewer jobs. 9% fewer if you're a high school graduate. Even if you have some college but no bachelor's degree, almost 10% more since 2007. Now this isn't the fluff that's in a newspaper made up on some anecdotal evidence of four people interviewed at random who have some kind of negative outcome that they'd like to write some story about. <laughs> this is an actual analysis of the entire economy. Now, does that scare you? Now, look at this one. Unemployment rates among individuals age 25 and older. Unemployment rates through the recession. This was the re recession right here where everybody took a hit. Green line were the people with the most education. All the other lines were people with lower levels of education. And don't, don't think that I think that somehow there's this hotty toddy snooty thing all about education. It's not about that. Who was the most adaptable? Who was the most adaptable through whatever was experienced? And then also I might note the relative position of these lines with each other. So, no recovery from the recession for people without the higher ad adaptation capability. No recovery. Now, I, 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 I have various levels of frustration during single meetings of the day. And I have between 10 and 15 meetings a day and sometimes more. But one of the things that is frustrating me the most lately is that people look at these charts and they're like, their eyes glaze over. And they say, well, you know, you use too many numbers. 
people just don't understand it. So there is no recovery for people with less than a college degree. Now they'll say, well, my cousin Albert didn't go to college and he'll make more money than you, fat boy, will ever have an opportunity to see. And I'll say, yeah, how many Alberts do you know? How many miles can you drive through the city of Los Angeles? Miles after mile after mile after mile with hundreds of thousands of people for which this is an unbelievable reality. Now, again, it's not about college, don't get me wrong. Everybody doesn't have to go to college. Everybody has to learn how to learn. Over in Tennessee, Governor Haslam over there has his Drive to 55 campaign. He's like, this is what he exists for. 90% high school graduation rate, 55% post-secondary degree certificate rate, and with that, he gets a 25 to 35% bump in his state's economy with no population growth. Now, when I talk about stuff like that, I've even talked with some of our uh, uh, local elected officials about that, they say that can't be true. They said it just doesn't work that way. I'm like, okay, except for all this data I gave you. So by the way, ASU, 207,000 graduates worked in Arizona in 2012. More college graduates went to ASU. In fact, it's 28% of all the college graduates in Arizona graduated from ASU. Now that's both good and bad. It's good because we're cranking them out and most of them are staying, including the international students that come, but we're not cranking out enough. And we make a big contribution to the economy, billions of dollars. Those specific graduates paid that many taxes last year. Turns out they pay a lot more taxes than everyone else. Almost all of them paid taxes in Arizona, about half of the residents pay no income tax. Almost all of them pay income tax. You're like, how can that be? That can't be true, we must be making it up. I don't, I've learned through the years in becoming a university president not to make things up. <laughs> it doesn't bode well in either academia, it just doesn't. If we just increased ASU's productivity of graduates, just that alone, which we are going to do, we're going to increase it. In fact, our board has asked us to produce 25,000 graduates a year by 2020. We will exceed that by 10% in our present scenarios. Just that alone will have the, these kinds of impacts, just to give you some idea of the sensitivity analysis of what a frontline unit like ASU is doing. So I won't walk you through all this. We could do that, by the way. Just us alone, that is one single small normal school, can affect the actual outcome of the state's gross state product. Now imagine if that same institution was also educating as it now is across the entire spectrum of our society. All families, all backgrounds. I won't keep walking through this. Just, just imagine that ASU is really cool really big, really scalable, very high quality, produces a fantastically important product to the future of the economy, an adaptable learner. So, by the way, college graduates, just look at this, are more likely to have access to and participate in employer-provided pension plans, have access to employer-provided health care, vote. Uh, this, by the way, if you don't graduate from high school, this is the percentage on Medicaid. 43%. If you graduate from college, 9%. So this is a funny thing about investment. It's like, oh, we're being ruined. I hear this sometimes. We're being ruined by the, by the public expenditures for health care. Well, yeah, you better believe we're, we're not only going to be ruined, we're being smashed into oblivion right now because we're under-investing in things that make those outcomes different on all levels. And I, you can read the rest of these. It's school lunches, other programs. So what's the challenge? So this is really analytical, I apologize, but the challenge is that, that these are, think of these as percentages. So we've got 
29% of people, um, uh, well, to make it work, by the way, we need, we need to get 75% of folks into some kind of post-secondary track. That, that doesn't mean university. That can be, that can be um, uh, college, te university, technical school. It can be community college. Uh, really dedicated uh, uh, tech schools, uh, not-for-profit, for-profit, if they're doing the right thing, if they're working on the right projects, if they're working in the right way, it's going to take everybody to make this thing work. This is where we were in 2010. This is where we needed to be in 2013 to hit these kinds of goals. So just think of these as getting almost everybody through college and then getting everybody up from where we are to a higher level of performance. And what I can tell you is that it's actually going in the opposite direction. No forward movement except for a few isolated institutions. So you get the gist of this. We need to move in that direction. We're not moving in that direction. Uh, current trajectories without innovation. And at the end of the day, it's all about innovation. What about Arizona? So college participation for low-income students in 2013 in the United States, almost 40% of kids from low-income families go on to something after high school in Arizona, only 29%. That is a huge difference in a fast-growth state. We will, before we're done growing, we will be one of the 10 largest states. Right now, I think we're 15th this year. This Salt River Valley, in 1903, I was reading some stuff about the Salt River Project from 1903, had 25,000 people, now it has 4.1 million. 4.1 million from 25,000 in 112 years. That's unbelievable. Now, that's where we sit in post-secondary education. Youths enrolling. Youths enrolling percentage. So let's find um, uh, Utah. See Utah right there? The People's Republic of Utah. So that state, right there, has 400 students in college per 10,000 residents. Arizona has 200 students in college of any type. Half the number as a part of the population. It's unbelievable. We're falling a little bit further behind. This is uh, appropriations. We know about that. But this is a... <laughs> Well, it's, it's, this is the way the world looked in the 1980s. This is the way it looked, and this is kind of the way it looks right over here right now. And that's on a per one, oh, this, by the way, the most important thing about this is that, is that this chart reflects dollars per thousand dollars of personal income. So it goes up, it doesn't go up or down, it's dollars per thousand dollars of personal income. So this, this, this would look to me like a fundamental policy shift. And so... But here, I think, is probably one of the most important charts that are out there. So this is per capita GDP relative to the U.S. average. So per capita gross domestic product relative to the U.S. average. So here's Arizona in 1999 at below 90%. But by the way, before the 1990s, Arizona was right up here, above 100% of the national average. Now, this is Arizona right now, right here, one inch above 80%. These are other Western states... Min minus uh, the West Coast version of Massachusetts known as California. And so minus, minus California, this is what the West Coast states look like. So that's uh, Arizona, New Mexico right there, Nevada. Uh, that would be Utah right there. This is uh, Colorado, uh, Oregon, and Washington. Those are above 100%. So what, when I offer this chart, by th this chart, by the way, this is the rough equivalent, equivalent of a pulled fire alarm. The fire alarm is ringing right now. We are at 80% of the per capita GDP for the United States. The fire alarm is ringing. So I'll say this to some people, including business leaders, and they'll say, well, you know, the reason for that is that we have lots of Hispanics. And then I'll say, really? How many does Texas have? Well, I don't know, they'll say. I, I said, yes. Well, there's this state, one state over, Texas. It's really big. There was a lot of big battles there. You know, a lot of fighting. Santa Ana got captured. Then he just gave the whole thing over. It became its own country. You know, he sort of walked, yeah, oh, that place. Okay, so that place, by the way, that place is above 100% of the, 
of the per capita GDP. And then they say, well, you know, that's all because of oil. There's always some non-analytically based explanation for the underperformance of Arizona against another place. We factor out the oil, it's still above 100%. So this tells you that there's a serious problem. And I suspect that the serious problem is related to educational attainment. That that is at the root of that problem. Now, how do I know that? I know that because of this chart. So remember, I'm wearing my professor hat. So this is the relationship between the change in educational attainment and economic development in the United States in the, la in the years 2000 to 2010. And this says, how much did your economy grow on a per capita basis? Did it grow? In Arizona's, it didn't grow. The economy is smaller, as well as are some others. And then how many new college graduates, 25 and older, have attained a bachelor's degree in that time frame? Now that line plotted through that series of dots, that's called a curve. And that curve has a slope. And the slope is reflective of the relationship. The relationship is definitively, directly, there is a strong correlation between the production of master learners at higher levels of education and per capita GDP increasing. Explain to me this following fact, and I have all kinds of sorry excuses that people give to me when I give them the fact. Why does every single person in Colorado represent an economy that's 25% larger per person than the economy in Arizona? It also is a very diverse population. It also has an economy similar to Arizona's, historically. And so it turns out that their level of educational attainment in Colorado is dramatically greater than ours. I won't spend much time on this other than to suggest that when you look at this nationally, it turns out there's a correlation between per capita GDP and also what's called the math, reading, and science scores. Now, the thing I wanted to point out here is this. Now, that's the country we're a part of. That's us. We're not in the orbit of the United States. So when you fall below the 80th percentile of per capita GDP, Many people say you're no longer a part of the core economy of where that particular country is going. So these are flashing red lights. So I didn't make that up. That comes from lots of people. Again, so some people say, that's terrible. I meet all these people that have college degrees that are working at Dillard's. Well, maybe they're working at Dillard's for four years on the floor to learn retail before they become an assistant buyer, before they become a buyer, before they become a store manager, before they become a district manager, before they become this, or before they start their own business. But they're likely to be more adaptable if they have that. So that's how many jobs open up every year that require in Arizona. That's how many high school graduates go on to college, and a quarter of them aren't ready for college. I would say that's that big cartoon phrase, rut row. I mean, it's like, you got a problem. We got a mismatch between where the labor market is and where the labor market is going and where preparation for the labor market is taking us. So here's the, the main thing. You solve this, you solve the economic trajectory for Arizona. 25% increase in the Hispanic population, sixth highest in the nation. That's the uh, Arizona population compared to the nation. I'd say that's a number probably really important to pay attention to, as are all these other numbers. Arizona population growth by ethnicity. This is 1990 to 2030. These are massive changes. Massive changes. This is going to be one of the largest states in the union, and we're at the 80th percentile of per capita GDP, with social service expenses increasing every year, with educational attainment actually not increasing. Age distribution, we've got a lot of old white people right over here. I'm not 70 yet, but I can see it. <laughs> This year, I go into this chart right here. <laughs> Not till October. <laughs> Point being, 
This, this is the thing that, you want to talk about red flashing lights, just look at these yellow lines from about here over. That is a certain outcome. Certain. Now, people know this. How can you not and be observant? Therefore, educational attainment for Latinos is not just important, it is, as is suggested here, an imperative. There are rumors that nearly everyone of Latino descent in Arizona isn't allowed to be here. Well, it turns out that's not true either. Just look at these numbers. So when people say we can't make these investments, we have to make these investments. Look at this number right here at the bottom, 44%. And that's going to go up. That's on a statewide basis. In this county, it's already majority minority. Already. And this is hard to read, but uh, you get some sense of the Latino students in terms of math and reading scores and the Anglo students in terms of math and reading scores. And so people are like, well, this, this is, so people will say, I'll, I'll even hear people say that, well, this is because of poverty. Like, really? That might be a variable of 15 variables. But I'm going to talk to you about that. That's not a predictive variable. It's not a predictive variable. Well, these kids over here, by the way, that come from families, and lots of them, that are just as poor as some of the families over here, that's not a predictive variable for them either. So, so here's some numbers that we have. This is four-year high school graduation rates. Some of these numbers are improving. All 76, that's some improvement. Anglo students, Hispanic students, and students with limited English. Now, how many think that all the limited English kids are kids that speak Spanish? Because if you think that, you don't know anything about Greater Phoenix and Arizona, and you don't see the world. The, I was with uh, the president of the International Rescue Committee, David Miliband, at uh, an event in Sedona last weekend. And there, they love Phoenix, and he was visiting all their rescue resettlement neighborhoods here in Metro Phoenix, from Sudan, Chad, Somalia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How many of you are aware of all this? Some of you. So that's another issue for Arizona. We're a fantastic place for people to come. Again, immigrating to the United States, wanting to be Americans. So here's college attainment. This is uh, Anglo versus Latino. Obtain a high school diploma or higher between 2000 to 2005 and 9. You can see these changes. This is uh, by age groups. And this is obtained a bachelor's degree or higher. Now this number right here, 11%, 10%, 9%. Let's just look at this, this number right here, 9% college attainment. These numbers, even for Anglo kids, are well below where it needs to be. All these numbers need to be right about right there. All of them need to be right about there. But that number right there, 9%, 10%, 11%, those numbers right there, these numbers, 61, 63, 64, those numbers, if those numbers are not, I'm just, you can, you can even take this videotape and show it 10 years from now. I will guarantee you, guarantee you, the economy will continue to underperform until these numbers change. It's as simple as that. The economy will continue to underperform until these numbers change. You saw the earlier data of the return to the individual, the return to the state, the return in terms of lower costs, the return in terms of higher taxes to pay for social services. So here's one thing that is absolutely unequivocally the case. That number right there, let's say that the Hispanic population is, we'll just round up to 50% of the population of the state. 50% of the population of this county, and this county is a huge part of the state, so let's just pretend that it's going to be 50% 50, 50 uh, folks of Hispanic origin, Latino origin, 50% other. It turns out that future economies in the United States, remember, we don't live in Bolivia. We don't live in the Philippines. We don't live in Albania. We live in the United States. The United States economy operates at the top of the heap in the world economies. That is, it must always be innovating or it falls back. It must always be adapting or it falls back. It must always be the leader or it falls back. There aren't very good scenarios for when we're not the leader. Now, if you have half your population at 10% college attainment, 
The predicted outcome is that you're at the 70th or 68th percentile of per capita GDP of the American economy. That number alone. Remember what we said about high school attainment? There are no more jobs. 14% fewer jobs for people with less than a high school diploma than in 2007. There will be no increase in those jobs. None. Therefore, you could build whatever set of policies, programs, initiatives, corporate, public, po private ventures, community college, university linkages, investment strategies, anything that you want, no matter what you do to advance the economy of the state, if you do not bring these two numbers closer together, the economy of the state will not be successful at the level that it has been in the past. It won't be successful at the level that the rest of the country will be successful, period. Again, welcome to Professor Land. More charts, more numbers. This goes to this same number, just to illustrate it again. That 10% attainment, call it 9%, 10%, whatever, it's about 17 points below where it needs to be it needs to be between 27 and 32. It needs to be in that kind of range. Now this number here, you notice that number there? I don't know what it is, whether it's like some kind of special Wheaties, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's true all over the country, but it's particularly true in Arizona. So, by the way, a lot of families don't have a lot of money. So it's not like they're sitting around hoarding their money, wanting to go to college or not wanting to go to college and spending it on something else. And it turns out that that number right there is the key determinant of college readiness. So you might have heard the other day that we announced this thing, and it's kind of funny, this thing where we're going to try to make it pathways to college. Take your freshman year for free. Take all the courses. Sit at the community college. Take these courses. Take these courses in your high school. No cost, no cost, no cost. How do you get more kids interested in college? How do you reach out and touch everyone? This is a percent of the population in poverty. High numbers. So, this is going forward. So it is the case that educational attainment and poverty is linked. Absolutely linked. So we need supposed to build up to this. <laughs> so let's say that you find yourself in this fabulous, unbelievably beautiful place called Arizona. I was in Sedona over the weekend. It was raining all weekend, and there were these clouds and light and the sun and the rain and the beauty of everything. It was, and there were people there from all over the world at this meeting. It was one of the most, they said this is one of the most beautiful places that anyone has ever been. And so you, we all find ourselves in this beautiful place in this fantastic place, this unbelievable modern land of opportunity. But we've got this problem. We have this uneven outcome. We have this uneven outcome. So if you find yourself in a place like that and you think that what you need to do is just build a university that looks like any other university, well, that's a mistake. You need to build a new kind of university. So in our case, we're like, why don't you build a new kind of university? And why don't you have it do that? So we have altered the very core of the existence of our institution, not from its own heritage. Its heritage is this. The faculty, the leaders, the community have allowed, have created an opportunity where this university could be constructed. Inclusion versus exclusion. Research to benefit the public and taking responsibility for the outcome of the community. Social outcome of the community. Economic outcome of the community. Health and well-being outcome of the community. Each of these. It means you cannot do what we're trying to do and have Arizona be successful if the institutions are the same as they are anywhere else. And this is as true for K through 12 as it is for higher education, as it is for any other kind of institution. All of the institutions that we have have produced those numbers. That's the design. That's the product of the present design. Therefore, the present design has failed. 
It doesn't mean the people that were running the present design are failures. It means it's run its course like anything else. It's time for new organizational genetic engineering. And so along the way, you need to build this or things like it. And this isn't the only thing. This is just one institution. Just one institution. So our goals, and I want to be clear about this, to demonstrate academic excellence and accessibility at the same time, to enhance our impact on the community, to become a global center for interdisciplinary research. Why is that still an objective? Because people will say to me, just forget that research stuff and educate our kids. That research stuff is distracting you from educating our kids. I said, actually, that research stuff is going to give to your kids that come to our university the most successful, state-of-the-art, leading-edge thinking and learning environment that anyone has ever created, and that's what we're building. So our idea of a master learner, general education, breadth of knowledge, the base, the things that you need to know to become a master learner. We are swarming this with technology like no human beings have ever before us at ASU with 150 partners. We think we can get technology to help us do that. Then if that's taken care of in that way, that frees up more energy over here for you to learn certain kinds of subjects. Not just one subject like history or electrical engineering or art or music or business, but maybe two majors or three majors and two languages because you're not slowed up by this and you've got you freed up some of your resources over here, both within the university and within the, within the uh, tuition payer or the state, and over here you can move more quickly. You then allow electives like there's no tomorrow. If you can get somebody to sit in a learning experience where they're gonna come out more creative and a faster and a better and a deeper and a more adaptive learner, then do it. And then at the end of the day, we've got to empower that because that's what's gonna enable us to be adaptive. So we're even approaching this, and how do we make this work to produce this master learner? At ASU, almost 40% of our, of our students are first generation learners. That's a huge number, huge. ASU Preparatory Academy, how many of you heard of that? So we're working on the pipeline, since so many of you heard about it, I'm not gonna spend much time talking about it, but look at these kids. So these kids are from wealthy families, right? I don't know about their individual circumstances, but the kids, what is it, Jim, at Percent Title I at ASU Prep in Phoenix? 75% Title I. So people said to us, and President Core is here, uh, and the Center for the Future of Arizona a few years ago did this beat the odds study where they said, let's go into a whole bunch of poor schools. Some over exceed, some under succeed. Why is it? Turns out that it's, it's the leadership of the principal, it's the curriculum, it's the analytics, it's the way that things are done and so forth. So we decided to see if we could make this work. 2,000 students, 1,100 at our Phoenix school, 839 at the Polytechnic school, 76% free and reduced lunch. Uh, we improved the reading scores by that much, the math scores by that much. Uh, ASU Prep will graduate its first class, 98% four-year high school graduation rate, 92% admitted to a two- or four-year college, 76% admitted to a four-year college. I don't want to tell you what the numbers are in that school district normally, but they're not quite that high. And that's not because we have extra money, we don't. That's not because we have extra resources, we don't. We have the school, we have our, our approaches, our ideas, and we have the lessons that were learned and beat the odds. And we have a structure and a design and an orientation that is different. So ASU Prep, this is the one on the Polytechnic campus where we built inside the university. I'm just trying to give you a sense of how this will work. This will work not just by institutions simply replicating the same old designs. Every institution has to change. All the K through 12 institutions, all the universities, all the colleges, everybody. So we, this school is the prep school on the Polytechnic campus, which is a STEM-oriented school. According to the Phoenix Business Journal just this year, it's one of the top three performing schools in, is it Phoenix or Arizona? I thought it was all of Arizona. Is it all of Arizona? Yes, all of Arizona. Outpacing the state. So access ASU. So we're working with partner school districts. We're in the neighborhoods, in the communities, working to try to affect positive outcomes. Partner school populations, you can see the 64% Hispanic. You can see by which partner schools that we're working with, trying to affect the pipeline. The scale of how we work, 70% low income, 80% non-Anglo. 
You've got to be on the front line. I, I say to people all the time, we are, and you would want us to be this way, I assume, we are a front line battlefield university fighting for Arizona's future, fighting for its economic outcome, realizing that educational attainment is one of, and I would say, the most significant factor leading to that positive economic outcome. Our Access ASU initiatives, thousands of visits, unbelievable activity going on. Students, numbers of students, again, the kinds of numbers that we're dealing with, the notion of our scholarship programs, families, Hispanic mother-daughter program, a fantastic program through, throughout the years, the Dream Academy, the Future Sun Devils, this again, again, the scale, the outreach. So people will say to me, how is it now that you actually have a student body completely representative of the socioeconomic demography of the state? How is it that you have that? We have that because we're designed to operate that way. We have that because we desire that. We have that because it's a goal. We have that because if we don't attain that goal, as a part of the teams working to attain the goal relative to the rest of the state, the state will not succeed. High school seniors and college readiness, you see the scores, who we're working with, financial inst institutional awards. So we have given that level of institutional support, 73% receiving a new American University Scholarship Award, 94% receiving institutional financial aid, Again, so it's money, resources, pipeline, engagement. Persistence rate, look at that persistence rate for these kids. 85% persistence rate. So I'll ask Laddie, is that an improvement over 1970, 1980? Absolutely. With larger numbers of students, six-year graduation rate. You might notice outperforming the general population of the university itself. So back to this notion that you can't take low-income kids from minority communities and minority schools and get them to be successful at the university, that would be false. TRIO program, community college program, I see Maria Harper Maranac here, the vice chancellor of the community college district. So uh, you can see this uh, uh, Maricopa College enrollment, uh, bridge to the, to the degree. 8,700 students with 12 or more credits earned a bachelor's degree from Arizona State University in that year. 8,700. That would be the largest number of community college initiated college graduates from any university in the country. That's that year. It'll be more this year. These are fantastic numbers, and the majority of those students, yes, just barely the majority of those students are minority students. So we have pathway programs. Financial aid awarded, this, this kind of, we awarded last year uh, all forms of financial aid, total aid awarded uh, $1,050,000,000 million approximately. That's our contribution, more than $200 million. This is financial aid to uh, his, Hispanic students or Latino students, almost $200 million with this level of financial aid from the university. And that's where we were in 06 and back in 03 and 04. These numbers were about at this level right here. Really small, if you can't see me over here. Think of this as small. Now this shows you average tuition paid for ASU full-time undergraduate students in the last academic year. So if you came from, if, this is the number of students that paid no tuition. This is the number of students that paid $10,000 of tuition. These are the number of Hispanic students. Number of students is blue, number of Hispanic students is green. So that's 2,500. I don't want to tell you what the size of that number is, but it's massive. And then watch the, watch the just back up here, the, uh, the, uh, this green line here moving across this way is, is large. So this is Pell recipients. This is where we were in 2001 and 2 numbers. This is where we are now. 25,000 of our students, 25,000 of our students at ASU as undergraduates are from median incomes and below, 25,000 undergraduates. How many Pell eligible students were at the football team that we beat in the Sun Bowl called Duke? 900. That's more Pell eligible students than attend all Ivy League and near Ivy League universities in the United States. That's our commitment to making these things work. So what's the impact of an education gap? 
a Latino education gap. That's it. How do you attack it? You attack it through innovation, you attack it through initiatives, you attack it through new designs, new approaches. Some of the approaches might be classic, but applied in a different way. Classical educations, but applied in a different way. You attack it by throwing out the notion that we can take the present model any further than we can take it. We cannot. It has to be adapted, it has to be modernized, it has to be the, the industrial economy on which this model, the, the, the industrial economy on which the model was based, the factory model, doesn't work anymore. A new model is needed. So, point being, very simple. If we achieve this, if we achieve this, Arizona will succeed economically. If we do not achieve that, it won't. Now that's hard for a lot of people to believe. It just is. It's just hard for them to believe. The evidence is substantial. I have 4,000 other slides. <laughs> if I click the but button on the left, a new device, you see that, where is that thing? Didn't we put in the transposition transponder <laughs> thing? If I push this button, some of you, not all of you, I can actually get them into your head without you even seeing them. <laughs> it's this button right here. Should I do it just to see what happens? <laughs> so the point that I'm trying to make this evening is that we have a very great place to live. We have fantastic opportunity. We, we live at a moment, whether you like it or not, where educational attainment is the key. Part of our community needs higher levels of educational attainment. When we achieve those higher levels of educational attainment, the ups, the downs of the economy, this incomplete economy that we've built, it's a, it's a new economy, it's incomplete. We will move past that. And this place will achieve a sustainable, non-growth oriented, non-real estate oriented only economic success pattern that should be a powerful, powerful outcome for Arizona and then set an example for the rest of the country. So, thank you. Thanks. I wanted to, to just kind of tie this together and, and wanted to do it from a perspective of our foundation where we are often asked, uh, given that we work both in Arizona and Florida, what do we find to be the biggest difference between the two states you know, when it comes to education? Uh, and there are some differences, um, but probably the biggest one and the most profound difference is that in Florida, the Florida leadership, education leadership, elected leadership, business community leadership, has clarity of purpose when they think about education. They don't argue or debate about whether or not Florida students should be receiving a post-secondary education. They don't argue about holding their students to high standards. They believe they should be high and they believe they should be higher. They don't argue about whether or not it's important that every student, regardless of their backgrounds or the color of their skin, succeeds academically. Now, mind you, they argue a whole lot, just like we do in Arizona. They argue about how do you go about creating the system and making sure that students are successful. But they don't argue about that clarity of purpose. And I think too often the difference is in Arizona, we still argue about whether or not we think college is worth it. We still argue about whether or not we think every student has and should have an opportunity to a quality education. And that's the biggest difference. And I think if there's anything we'd like you to take away from tonight is an understanding is that we believe from a Helios perspective that this is the clarity of purpose that we need to come together to hold true and stop arguing about. We need to understand that the future will be defined in Arizona by whether or not we can lead the nation in Latino student success and the economics that that will drive for the future of our state. Dr. Crow put up a slide and it showed a vision or a potential future for Arizona. When you think about the Latino population, as we know, the changing demographics of the, the fastest growing community in the state, and you think about the future without education attainment, 62% of the largest population in the state will live in poverty. What does that really mean? What will that be? 
And when you believe as we do that education changes lives and makes communities better, what it tells us is we need to provide education to make this community, our communities, our state better. You all represent the leadership of this state. And what we're going to ask you to consider is to adopt a clarity of purpose that the future of Arizona will def be defined by Latino student success. And we can lead the nation in showing what an education system committed to that will look like. We're also going to ask you to use, quite frankly, what you wield uh, that is most powerful, is your power and your influence. A leadership group like this has the power to change the discussion in Arizona. It has the power to change the future of Arizona. We ask you to embrace the Latino education opportunity as our own, to take on the challenge of leading the nation in what this could be and the opportunity this represents for our state. And we ask you, as we always do, is let's do this in partnership. Let's do this in partnership together because we know that's the only way that this will happen. That's the only way that this will be successful. But let's begin with that clarity of purpose of saying we know what we want to do. We know what we want to achieve. Yes, we can now argue about how to do it and how to get it done because there will be those arguments. But let's never forget what that clarity of purpose of what we're trying to achieve. And the question that I would ask you to ask is when people are advocating for a point of view or direction for change, Ask yourself the question and challenge others and says, what will this do to improve Latino student success? And if we stay focused on asking each other that question and challenging each other on that question, we can figure out in Arizona what we need to do to change our system, to come together, and to create the type of Arizona that we all want to be a part of, and one that isn't with families living in poverty. Arizona has an opportunity to lead the nation when it comes to educating Latino students. It will take government leaders, elected leaders, to provide the type of policies that we need. It will take education leaders, business leaders, community leaders to understand and commit that this is a priority for our state. It will take investment. It will take us providing resources to improve education in order for us to be able to ensure that every student has access to a quality education.